Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm joined by Alan. Alan, why don't you introduce yourself to people who don't know you? Most will. Um, I heard your story on Karen's. So <laughs> maybe maybe you can find a way to tell your story and highlight things that I haven't heard there so that so that I can learn even more about you. And maybe that gives me like more things to, to latch on to. Uh, it can be as long or short as you want. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's just, uh, you know, right before we started recording, uh, Lucas was just saying some wild stuff. I just want everybody to know that he's completely different off camera. Like, I don't I don't want to, like, be rude, but, like, he was just yelling at me. He's like, this better be good. Like, I need to make some money off of YouTube. And I was like, okay, I'll do my best. So, guys, I'm, I'm trying to make my story as, like, enjoyable as possible. He's like, he's like, what are you do make it good? I need to go viral right now so you know i just i mean i'm I, I, hey i'm just a simple simple man so i'll do my best to tell my story as i can but lucas clearly wants you know he's like i need those sweet sweet super chat dollars so but uh you gotta I, take your uh, shirt off man just to start <laughs> you know i mean i've been i've been using your old workout videos i'm trying to get jacked i'm like guys everybody tune into like go oldest to newest and then just get jacked and learn the piano that's the real insight of this channel <laughs> it's like don't forget about nietzsche forget about connecting with others it's about getting jacked and learning to pay, play the piano okay eat to life yeah okay we need to focus back in i don't want to hear about your marriage or how much you love your wife anymore or how many friends you're making or connecting with I, that that we're done okay we're learn we're we're learning about cross the crossfit games and matt fraser okay so, but, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've just seen your content around and I reached out and wanted to connect, so, cause, uh, I like your stuff and, um, the, uh, yeah, I, I really just stumbled on the corner when, uh, I sort of was out of college figuring life out and, uh, like wasn't religious, wasn't spiritual, wasn't any of these things. Um, you weren't raised in that way at all? uh i was raised like we went to church but it wasn't it's was very much so like something you did maybe twice a month um mm -hmm. maybe once a month and and it wasn't like emphasized i would say so i did not have i only stood understood like christianity as like something you did because you have to mm -hmm. yeah as like i mean um <laughs> which is funny because it does have its own uh even growing up i had my own like i don't want to say like i felt nothing but i did definitely did have a like oh i liked i was never an atheist uh and it sort of had like team generally team like oh Christi you know like i've had positive associations but it was never one of those things where i'd ever like pick up the bible or pray or do anything it was just generally associations of like this is in the same way like you know, red, you know, one soccer team versus the next, you know. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, that, that was the upbringing. But uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think like a lot of young men, actually, like, I think none of us saw this coming. But uh, it's just funny seeing after college, a lot of, you know, I, I had a good job. Things were going fine. And uh I had a girlfriend and everything's going, going good. We're having a good time. And then just like hitting this wall of like, I do, you know, I do not want to continue down this path. Like I really feel unfulfilled. Um, and that for me looked like, you know, packing all my things into my car, go driving to my girlfriend's house, breaking up with her and then literally getting back in my car and driving to my parents' house in New Jersey, you know, from Washington, DC. So that was, you know, that was definitely a big, was that gradual the way that those feelings started to come up or was that something that just like hit you like one week to the next? Um, I think it, uh, hmm. I think it was, you know, gradual until it became, you know, it's a slight knocking that you could ignore or a slight pang that you yeah. could ignore. And then, uh, it slowly became like overwhelming to the mm -hmm. point where, I mean, you know, I've told this before, but it's, it's like, 
you know, I mean, at the end, I mean, because I really like, you know, I had this good job and I was happy, you know, I have a good girlfriend, you, we get along, we, we're actually doing comedy together, like we literally did comedy shows together. Um, so you're like, what could be better? It's like, everything's packaged into one. I've just put my girlfriend, my comedy hopes and dreams, like, we're basically living together. Like, it's all I, you know, I compressed it all into the perfect, you know, yummy, delicious life, you know. And, you know, my, you know, my job wasn't difficult, you know, working like 40 hours a week. So not not too, too hard. And um, but yeah, I think like, on the one hand, you're like, everything's working like this is supposedly everything I could want, you know, I, I make enough money to support myself, I can go out to dinner, I can, you know, have all the yummy, delicious things that I want, and, you know, go do comedy shows and have a girlfriend and have, you know, young professional friends or friends in the city. And, uh, and then like, I just think the pangs of like, see, watching, losing the desire to continue down that road was like at first you're like you don't even want to address that because it's like that's painful you know let's, let's like you don't even have another thing to want you know it's not like oh i'm wanting something else it's like the thing that i already want is slow watching that crumble yeah. is you're like i don't want to i don't want to stop you know i don't want to i don't want to stop wanting this um which is like because it's like there's nothing to jump toward there's nothing to be like i'm gonna go from this to that yeah um and so i think that was like a real like oh this sucks uh and then i mean i think that what really flipped it was you know i i had like um you know i had a dream of of my girlfriend at the time in a wedding dress and the idea of like, I woke up from the dream and you'd be like, oh, that's a nice dream. Your girlfriend in a wedding dress. Like, and I just was like in a dead panic. I was just like, oh, what God, what just happened? And just like, you know, just like a cold sweat of just like, this sucks. This is not mm. good. And what's worse is like, it's not like I was like, oh yeah, this makes sense. This is, this is the path. I understand. It was, it was sort of, um, uh, like, like just the crumbling of something else. I, I, you know, it's just the, uh, that's all the way, like the death of that, like that fulfillment of like moving towards a goal. And um, yeah, I remember like uh, my mom, when I told her I was moving, she came down to DC um, and helped me move, pack my car up. And like, I don't, <laughs> I think of myself as a pretty even keeled person day to day, not very, you know, not very stressed out, you know, just nice, nice things are good. But I remember when we were packing my, my, all my belongings away, just like the ringing, my, my mom turned to me to say something to me. And I just remember like, I can't hear what she's saying because my heart is beating so fast. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, she's like five feet away from me and I have no idea what she's trying to say to me because I can't hear her over the sound of my own heart beating. And it was like, not like, like nothing was, you know, was I'm just talking to someone in a room to anybody in a camera I'd be like this looks normal but inwardly so yeah. um but yeah I mean that was just the beginning though it, it's not like that led to any like that was just the kicking off of moving to New York and you know I got a new job but that new job was brutal I worked with oh my gosh I called them the mean mean robots like I added these coworkers who were just so they did not like me at all and just like would just all the, the only time they would speak to me was to like ask where something was be like have you done this did this happen and i'm just like this is horrible i do not like this uh also like my man it was clear there's only one person that sat next to me at the job and like like the after the 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 christmas party or the holiday party at the end of the year Literally the next day, I didn't even go to the party because I was so, I hated the job so much. The next day on my desk was a note that was like, your desk was messy this week, like clean it up. And I'm like, it was anonymous. No one signed it. But I was just like, clearly it was my manager who sat, like no one else would care that I had like my uh, de messy desk. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. I'm being like bullied. I feel like I'm in middle school again. So um, just, uh, but I think... Uh, 
the reason for all this long storytelling and for all this is just um like I didn't expect or want and in general I've always thought I'm really blessed I have a great family great friends you know all these things but even having that cocoon nest even having that those walls around me of having all these good things it's like you're gonna go through like the hardships of life and the values that you have are going to be tested and what you put your time and attention toward is going to like you're gonna you know you're gonna reap as you've sown and like you got to be careful what you what you care about because if those things crumble if you're your your desire to become a comedian or an artist or to get really rich or your relationships if they crumble like that's your way of feeling good is like that's your way of you know feeling like you're in the right place doing the right things um and so having that like crumbling uh i think needed to happen but at the same time it's like it's painful that it it happened and then you go through it And I think one of the hardest things is you realize no one really, no one can really help you there. Or there are very few people like no one wants to like, they'll, they'll, you know, I have support. There are people around me, you know, I was able to live at my parents' house for a little bit. So it's but like emotionally or like in terms of relate relating to other people, people are just like, yeah, it stinks. You, you know, sorry that your job is bad. Sorry that your relationship didn't work out, but like, you know, you'll figure it out. But I'm like, But I, I figured it out the first time and then mm -hmm. that blew up and sucked. So if I figure it out again, won't it just blow up again? Like, it's not like I learned anything yet. It's not like I'm a different person. It's just now I'm just like, I really, <laughs> the only knowledge I gained is that I'm an idiot. You know, like the only knowledge I gained is I don't understand any of this and why this is happening. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I just think that's a jumping off point to to like actually ask some of these questions. And, you know, I don't think... And I think it's great. I've seen like a lot of young men online, you know, like, and, you know, in person asking the big questions, reading philosophers, going to church, you know, finding, you know, spiritual, whatever it is, but trying to ask the questions and, and uh, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, finding a community of people like in the TLC and, you know, and, and in other places, but finding a community of people who are at least willing to sit down and talk and, and have a conversation and not afraid of the deep topics um uh it's like that's really refreshing and it's funny even like yesterday um like i found out something that a na you know a neighbor was going through and i was just like wow that seems like really difficult like that this person is going through uh and then you get like you you sort of bring it up to people and they're like yeah that's difficult but they don't want to like talk about yeah. why why it's happening or what you should do and if it ever happened to you or how you can support they're like yeah of course it's difficult like let's move on and i'm like dang like i don't i don't feel like I, you you know you think there's this sort of in case of emergency break glass in life where it's just like well if things were really bad like they're you know I break the glass, I pull the fire alarm, like, you know, yeah. people would rush in and like we'd figured it out. But like it's like, no, you're kinda you kinda gotta do it. That's sort of like the call to adventure of like you gotta figure out what you're gonna do with your life. And uh So when did that happen? Like you're at the job in New York. How long did you stay in that job before you changed something? Um well, luckily for me, and it's kind of one of those like it's one of those good examples of you're often closer than you realize to a new, you know, like you can feel so far away or you can feel horrible. And like, I was definitely like, I remember just like going to bed and just being stressed just like until I closed my eyes. And then when I opened my eyes, I was stressed again, you know, just like this job stinks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but like randomly they're like, oh yeah, do you want to like, we need writers. Like, do you want to be a writer? And I'm like, yeah, I want to be a writer instead of being like doing what I'm doing. And they're like, okay, like you have to do these three things. And like the person who was like the one evaluating my work and being like, are you smart enough to be a writer? Um, they were like about to like go on maternity leave and then leave the company forever. So It's like they barely cared it's like they were like oh yeah you look good whatever like here's this new job so it's like hilarious to think like i'm like i'm locked into this job and like this is bad and like nothing is going good and my life is it's on the precipice of death and then the next minute they're like 
sure, yeah, you want this different job that, you know, okay, that's fine, you can do that. And I'm just like, okay. And then I love that job. And I'm still a writer at an ad agency. So it's one of those things where like, you think like, wow, I, I suck at everything. I'm I'm the worst. I, I hate this. You know, everyone hates me because I'm sucking my job. And then two seconds later, they're like, yeah, you can just do this different job that is perfectly suited for you. And like everyone treats you well and they respect your creativity. And, and I'm not saying, you know, sometimes you are really far from, from a new place and you have to go through a lot, but it was funny that literally I would like, didn't even have to like change, you know, desks basically, Yeah. you know, it's like, you know, I found something. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think actually that, that is interesting because I don't think that was complete happenstance. I did take the, the original job because it was close to a writing job. Like I knew that it was in an ad agency and, um, and it was close. So like, I do think in some ways I knew that like, what I really wanted to do was be creative for a living and do something creative. But like that idea was so hard to believe, you know, cause just when you're growing up, I'm like, yeah, sure. I want to be a creative person for a living. And I also want to ride a unicorn to work and take my spaceship to the moon on the weekends. Like, sure. Whatever. Like that was just such a foreign concept of doing creativity, creative work. Um, yeah. And uh, so that was another thing I had to work out. So I, I know that this is a, a series of kind of looping strands, but um, but yeah, I mean, then I was able to switch over and it worked out. And I mean, honestly, I do think that that moment of making the switch to doing a writing career really did. Um, it was sort of the proof of concept of like, Oh, yeah, like a lot of the things you believe about the world are wrong and you need to figure out yourself because getting a writing job and being like, oh, this is great and there's a good career path for me and you, I enjoy doing it and people treat me well, like it sort of gave the permission to be like, oh, yeah, like you don't, you know, everything you believe isn't true and you need to figure out a lot of this stuff. Um, and I think honestly, that was the thing that like sort of allowed me to start going to church or really seeking faith more earnestly because I was like oh I don't know like I can't just say like this is true or this is not true or I know this or I don't know that um you know I was able to be like oh wow I was an idiot and I really just wanted to do this the whole time and I you know now that I figured this out it's given me permission to try other things and mm -hmm. like question the underlying beliefs about a lot of what I'm doing and also like when things are painful Eventually, they get so painful that you're like, okay, even if it means betraying the things I s supposedly believe, like, it, things are so bad right now that I gotta, I gotta do something, you yeah. know, like, things are so not good that I gotta do something with my life, you know, and, and, and it gives you, gives you the, it affords you the window to, like, make a new decision and decides, you know, to change your path, because you're like, I don't want to change my path. I don't want to, like, new paths suck. That's the thing. It's like to really earnestly trying something new or jumping off of a, a, a way forward. And you know, that, you know, we have what, what a plan looks like is honestly is very often more complex than what we think. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people be like, well, I'm, you know, I have no plan. I backpack across the country and I went to Southeast Asia and blah. blah. It's like, but that's a plan of its own. Mm -hmm. Like your plan of, of, of being free in that way is its own type of plan. So if you suddenly lost that, then you would suffer because you'd be like, well, I had a plan, which was to have no plan. <laughs> you know, like even the not having a plan is a plan of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and so the point just being of like, when you lose that, when you lose your like understanding, your map of the world, um, it sucks. And I can understand why people wouldn't want to like, I don't know. I, I don't want to lose my map of the world. That's that's not fun. Yeah. That's, that's horrible. You know, it's something to hold on to. And then you have nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, but yeah, I think that that like going through those difficult situations actually was the impetus to be like, I'm going to let go of this map of the world and I'm going to try something new. Um, and that, you know, and I mean, from there, I mean, I've been really blessed. I mean, I stumbled across like Paul Vanderclay's videos and Verveke and Peugeot and you know, I have a great church community and, you know, I feel like there's, there's, there's something, there's something to, 
put yourself into. There's like work to be done and something to be talked about. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's just why I'm here talking to people and meeting new people and went to the Northwest Estuary. And, and I think that the dialogue we're having here, whatever side people are on of it or whatever part people are attending to, a lot of that dialogue is valuable. You know, it is like, what you know, even if you're not, whatever side or place you're in on it, like the, that conversation about values and why we value what we value, I think, uh, I think it needs to happen right now. And and people are, you can feel people's maps starting to slip or, you know, starting to be less useful as you talk to them. And like yeah. some of these questions that I think uh, a lot of people, you know, me when I was a young man, a younger man, uh, had to deal with, but you know, it's like, it's good to just meet people to have this conversation with because it's not it's not just the conclusions that are the important part. It's also just the relationships. Th those will be more sturdy. You know, oh, I, I have all the wisdom in my head right now. I know everything. I know all the answers. They're in my brain right now. It's like, well, that's less important than like building the types of relationships where you could actually share that knowledge and 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 have it be used over time, you know? It's like it's not just the conclusions that we need it's the networks of connection to share those uh like conclusions to share the difficulties and to like relate to one another that's just important so like the idea of like well i just finished thus you know i just spent, finished nietzsche the collected words of nietzsche and now i'm in the ubermensch and you know i'm sitting on the couch being the ubermensch and now i'm, I'm mowing my lawn being the ubermensch and you know okay and you know oh no i have a brain tumor i guess i'm gonna die but i'm still mm. the ubermensch and you know like yeah that you know doing that i mean that you know that seems like well what would you know that would be less you know meaningful than being able to like relate to other people and connect and like over time share these this knowledge and 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 realize that it's like an unfolding you know process over time and so you're engaging in a lot of conversations, uh, building, let's say, relationships, and that seems to be important to you. Is that something that you take with you in your daily life as well? Let's say, in your, like in your embodied existence, in your job, in, and you're still doing comedy, I assume, also. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean the. I think what's I, I'm like in an estuary group and I don't know if your viewers don't know what that is. It's basically just a meetup where you have a conversation. That's literally it. It's just people <laughs> meeting and having a conversation. I like that. It's, it's condensed. A, you know, it's just I mean, it's so funny because like all the backstory and all the stuff. Yeah, it helps and it helps people open up to have a conversation. But like if you're trying to explain it, someone's literally a group of people meeting up and having a conversation. It's us being like, wow. I'm so brilliant. I figured out how to have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's like reverse engineering, just the thing. Yeah. 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 Let's do, okay. Let's do a podcast, except it's you meeting up with a person and you talk to them and then you don't record it. It's that it's the, you know, it's going to be the, the hot new trend. It's people meeting up, talking to each other and not recording them. Yeah. You know, it's going to be, you know, the ephemeral podcast. Uh, but yeah. So yeah, I mean, estuary, why I brought that up is because, um, yeah, I just have an estuary group where people don't really know about TLC or Verveki or Peugeot or, you know, thus spoke Zarathustra or any of that stuff. But I think having groups of people where you can connect and discuss and be um, vulnerable and honest with each other. And it's taken time to build that up. So, you, you know, you do it consistently week by week. But having those groups of people is um like that's important you know bringing it into the real world um and even like uh you know a church like uh you know trying to talk to people and i did i did a small group about movies and seeing sort of the hero's journey and other uh and christian elements inside of movies and um you know i think like building up a network of people where you can actually have that vulnerability. It sounds so like lame when you say it that way, but like building up connections such that you can actually share these things. It's like that, that's just as valuable as any of this other junk, you know, like just 
being able to start the ball rolling. It's, I think people want to, in any, in any craft, I think that doing the fundamentals really well is such a powerful tool. And I think often when, when we're in these circles, people want to be the guy who's doing 10,000 pushups a day while he's reading Jordan Peterson, while he's mewing, you know, he's got the jawline going and he's getting 12 hours of sleep when, you know, he's doing crunches while he's sleeping. And it's like, it's like you're, you're striving, you're trying to get to the top, top of the hierarchy, but that hierarchy is going to be less robust because you're doing it alone. And like, what are you going to do when you're the, like, you've read all of Jordan Peterson and you have six pack abs and you have a great jawline, like, okay, what you're going to like sleep with a bunch of girls or you're going to like be a monk or like, what, what is that end goal is like, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll be better than you or like, I'll do this or I'll, you know, I'll have more status than you do. And it's like, okay, okay. You have more status. Great. That's not, you know, I can't tell you not to want that, but mm. like, it's less robust than being able to kind of, I think, do do those things with other people over time, have connect, you know, build up yourself, but other people. It's like there's a there's also the factor of not just you climbing the hierarchy, but it's what what good are you getting and who is getting it and how long is that good lasting and all these other elements of like, guess what, like. You get, you know, like you get a six pack abs, you take the photos with it, you do your bodybuilding show, you go to the beach, like, guess what? You can lose six pack abs in like a year. You know, like how many dudes tell you like, oh yeah, when I was 22, man, I was shredded. I was shredded, dude. You don't understand. I was peeled and shredded. And it's just like, okay, did it bring you like long-term happiness? Like, no, but when, you know, but now anytime someone talks about the gym, I talked about when I was peeled and shredded and when I was jacked and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I don't want to like destroy those. I don't want to like make fun of them too bad. Cause it's like, they're just trying to figure out life like everyone else. But there's this factor of being able to make sort of more robust progress over time. Uh, that is more durable that, that you have deeper connections with other people that I think is more lasting than a lot of the, a lot of, um, a lot of the the answers that people are coming to is like, oh, well, I'm, I'm sort of drifting in life. I don't have a direct goal. I don't have a clear direction. So I'm just going to pick a hierarchy and then get to the top of it as fast yeah. as I can. And it's like, that's that's fine. That's like a good start. But like hierarchies themselves have value attached to them. And some hierarchies are more durable and some hierarchies are less durable. Um, so thinking about being wise in what hierarchy you choose. And, you know, sometimes that means humbling yourself. Sometimes that means like not looking as high status. Sometimes that means, you know, all these other things. Um, but yeah, that's the, um, you know, I think being that, that point is just to say that that gives me, that affords me the opportunity to like, just show up to church and make coffee and like, right. and like put chairs out and, you know, help move stuff. And, you know, that, and you could say like, well, anybody can do that. It's like, yeah, but they don't because they don't see the window of opportunity there. You know, they they don't have the, it's like, why would I, you know, like, are there going to be, you know, are there going to be any girls there? Or, or am I going to get Jack? Am I going to shred it? Like, it's like, no, none of those things are going to happen at church. Like, hopefully, you know, hopefully everyone has their shirt on at church and everybody's being nice, you know, like, I mean, maybe you could find a wife, I guess. But the point is, is uh, like, most people would be like, well, that's a waste of time. But it's like, it's only a waste of time if you don't have the vision, if you don't have the window of opportunity to see how having a community of light, of people who are connected with one another, having friends and family and all these things, that that is more durable, that that will be a longer term good than any of these other things. So that sort of affords you the ability to like, Go to your job and be kind to people and see the value in that. Go to your church and have a conversation with a random nice old lady who's like, oh, my name is Gertrude and I love tapioca. And like, oh, hi, Gertrude. I love tapioca, too. And, you know, and you can just have a little conversation. It's like, is that going to make you the Ubermensch? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Gertrude has the secret to becoming the Ubermensch. Maybe. Probably not. But, you know, these little windows give you the, afford you like a chance, uh, like, when you have the window of sight of why it'd be good to do these things, you have, you can actually give yourself permission 
to actually go and participate and go to estuary and be nice to people at your job and do all these little things that are always available theoretically to anyone. But a lot of people just don't have the the vision to see why you'd want to do them. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's funny you use the frame of like the, the Jack person, the Ubermensch. Um, because of course it's like, for me, it's relatable to think about different hierarchies that I used to want to pursue. And mm. I always expected to like get rid of one and move to the other. <laughs> and yeah, I find the one that is focused on relationship hard to go beyond, let's say. Mm. Uh, I like, I wonder, do, do you think sometimes that maybe there's there's something here that we're doing that we're going to look back on like oh no actually we were you know like the way you're talking about the other few now is there something that we're missing still um yeah. like how much should you poke holes into that type of thing yeah i do and i do have that secret but it's behind a paywall um right. and you have to subscribe to my oh, patreon Emma. and you gotta no um i mean i think that the like to, to your point here is like this is why the like doing the little things that we're doing now is valuable because it's like all you can do is mm -hmm. like you can't know like there's a great phrase that i read from nasim taleb of you can't something can't be invented like you can't know that something's going to be invented until it's invented like you can't just say like oh in 10 years this will be invented because it's like well, if we knew the, how to invent something, if you were certain about something, you'd already invent it, you know, like, and you can like guess, like maybe based on these other factors, this will happen, but you just can't, there could be a blocker in the way and it's never invented, you know, like, um, and the reason I bring that up is like, yeah, there's going to be new challenges and new difficulties and there's going to be new meanings and I still do still do think that there's status to be gained and, and there's work for people to do, right? That there's places to spend their time. But we don't like we can't know that what the future stat hierarchies are going to be until we get there. So all we can do is do our best to be prepared to meet them when they come. And so like each one of us, um, why I say that is like, you could have a great life and you could be like, I have my wife and I have a, you know, I, 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 I have my community and I have my family and everything is good. But then one day, you know, you have the opportunity to be like, actually, I think I'm going to invent a cure for cancer. And then you're going to like go down a pathway of like becoming a doctor, a researcher, and then doing all this. It's like, but you didn't know that that was going to be the thing that you could do you didn't know that you were going to do this type of thing. So all you could do is try and be like, I'm going to put myself in a position to be the best type of person to handle whatever problem is going to come my way. So I think preparing, why I say that is like preparing yourself and preparing your community and having your life in order when like the chaos comes or whatever comes, it's like, it will come. The chaos will come. You'll you'll have a new meaning in your life. You'll have the moment where you're like, I think I need to do this or someone's sick or I want to become a professional. This that moment will come and there are going to be hierarchies to ascend and things to do. But it's like you can't know what that is until it happens. So the best you can do is try and have the connections and look for the things you can do now. Yeah. Um, and so I think that like that's that's the that's the secret of like relationship and connection of like, it's, it, it's, um, it's getting your house in order. And then when, 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 when sort of the call to adventure does come, it's like being ready to go pursue it, but you have your eyes and ears open and you know what you value and what's important. So mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, the connection and the relationship is part of it, but then the call to adventure and the ascending the hierarchies is another thing that everyone's going to be called to do at a certain point. So, you know, if, if you have your eye, if you know, if you have your relationships in order and you have your eyes and ears open, like eventually you're going to be struck with like, this is what I think I need to do, or this is a direction in my life. Or like, I see this as a, as an opportunity. And, um, 
I don't know what that's going to be for you. I don't know what it's going to be for me, but like you, you know, it give it affords you the opportunity to be like, okay, I'm just going to set my house in order. I'm just stealing Peterson language, but I'm going to set my world in order the best I can. I'm going to try and care about the things that I can care about. I'm going to try and be connected in the ways. And like maybe a cool opportunity just shows up and like, you're like, wow. And now I can really put myself into this. Uh, and then, and then you'll be like, but you, you can't know what that's going to be. That's the thing. It's like, you can't, and it, and it's not really, I can't tell you how to do that. Like you will have to figure it out in the moment, you know? Um, so, yeah. And so part of my um, religious conviction, let's say why I like the worldview of Christianity is because based on reading uh, the gospels, I cannot find anyone more high to to let's say emulate than than the figure of Christ, mm. um, and almost every action I take, I try to like take this you know mm. perspective with me of like how how would he behave here, and one thing that I've been thinking about is I never read him being like particularly funny or anything, <laughs> but I really like play and and fun and uh and comedy as well which are spending a lot of time on too so question number one is do you think that jesus was funny or do you think he had good wit uh no which is why i will never make jokes ever again and i'm cutting myself <laughs> off and i uh, just won't ever be funny and you know god will embrace me with a frown God will be like, well done, my son, you know, my, my faithful servant. And I'm going to be like, yes, I never made any more jokes after talking to Lucas. Um, and we'll just frown in heaven forever and just be grimacing. Um, but um, I, I mean, I do think, it, you know, it says he's fully God and fully man. So uh, that's my conviction. So it's like, I'm sure he, I, I, I do think that sometimes we interpret it through a framework of we're trying to extrapolate from Christ rules about how to live. And I think the rules are a lot flimsier than just the way of being that if you just say like, well, this is what he means by this, or this is the rule that we can extrapolate from this. And I think because people try and do that, or this could be what, because people try and do that, they read him as a super serious or like, this is yeah. this is and he does have moments obviously of you know he braids a whip and whips people in the temple um so he does obviously have but i mean you know i do find that he has like moments of deep connection and intimacy and you, you read the story of like the woman at the well and 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 there's and, and lazarus and clearly he has such a love for the people around him um so i don't like Maybe it's that I've heard that he's you know never surprised that com com so much of comedy has to do with being surprised, yeah. uh, and maybe it's I I you know this is my theory, but maybe it has something to do with Christ not being surprised. But I don't I don't find I think that when we try and ultra make him ultra serious and like be like no he just it's like he could have sent the the thousand commandments you know okay instead of the 10 commandments we got the 10,000 commandments and like you know we're just going to write them on a big wall and you know you're going to know everything you need to do but it's like you know Christ came to like live and dwell amongst us and like now we have you know now he's we have the holy spirit so it's it's not i think it's much more about the relationship it's much more about the connection than anything else um so doesn't I have no uh, um, no problems imagining Christ as like a loving, intimate like person that you could have a real, real like connection with, and he's not just like some robot who's like, "You are messing up my perfect world. This is bad. You are evil." Like, you know, he has like real connections, and uh, but I also do think there's inherently a limit to comedy that comedy can sort of point out the shortcomings and point out like things you didn't expect uh, or make connections you didn't expect, but it's not, 
it sort of can move things out of the way or point you to new things. But I don't think it's, it's not like all encompassing. Like there definitely are shortcomings and things, times not to be funny and times not to use comedy. Um, and, uh, and so there, uh, you know, I, I definitely think that like, Yeah, I guess he just decided not to come back as a comedian. You know, like <laughs> he he could have been, but that's not the the that's not what he felt like he needed to say in the moment. So, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah. I, but I do I do think like God is you know God is fully capable of of comedy and being funny. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me it feels like a an elemental part of life, like to you know, to play and to be yeah joyous. And I just feel like yeah, I never read about that <laughs> in the gospel. But I'm I'm sure like it it's probably like there's a reason behind that as well. But it's just mm -hmm. something that seems to um be so central in in my life. And then I heard also that I was re-listening to the biblical lectures from from Jordan and He says that um, the Bible is technically a comedy, uh, meaning that it starts it starts in a state of like goodness and and perfection, and then it falls into chaos, and then it ends up in goodness and perfection as well, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to a tragedy. But I never really heard that that like definition of a comedy. I never really thought about it like that. <laughs> I don't know. Have you? Yeah, I think, I mean, they made us learn that uh, with like when we, they taught us Shakespeare. And I was like, this stinks because comedy just means two completely separate things. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make a lot of sense, like the connection. <laughs> yeah. So I never understood it. I mean, I'm sure people are going to be like, oh, these these buffoons, they don't understand that the word comedius comes from the Latin. And I'm going to be like, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm a dumb dumb. I don't understand any of this stuff. So did um, you did you get into comedy like early on in your life? um yeah i think you just can't help it like i don't even think like the training and it being like a formalized art form like i think is very much a add-on it's like something you layer on and it can be helpful to a degree and like you know meet other funny people but like it's much more like just like like it's just a way of seeing things you know like if you're like the first time that you like are like in the first You know, I'm sure you're making little jokes when you're like an infant, but like, or, you know, when you're a young kid, but like the first time you're able to like relate to adults or make a make someone laugh or or take a situation and turn it on, turn it on its head. Um, it's just like it's so hard to tell people why it's funny, but it is funny. Everyone laughs. So it's just like, you know, you start to see the humor and everything of like, you know, all these little jokes that you say are just really expressions of seeing something weird in the world, you know, seeing these weird little things that no one notices or talks about. Um, and yet we all seem, we all understand them because when you make a joke, everyone laughs and they only laugh because they understand what you're trying to say. And so, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's all these thousand of little, like little micro weird things that go on and, you know, little jokes to be made and you know and if you just if you just call out the the humor in the situation everyone knows what you're talking about um and you know it's like even with these podcasts i always laugh of like in the one hand i just want to connect to people and i just want to like talk to people and it's great just whoever it is just having a nice conversation learning more about them making friends but on the other hand it's like but what about if i went viral and was famous and became rich and there's also that you know like there's that desire so there's these like counter desires and like i don't really think i'm going to be rich and famous but like you know there's a reason people like putting it up on youtube people like getting downloads and are like you know views and vote upvotes so like just making a joke of like being like the point of our conversation today is to make me rich and please say something interesting that goes viral so I can be rich. Uh, you know, like, yeah, just like on one hand, like, you know, it's just fun pointing it out. It makes you giggle, makes you laugh and, uh, you know, bring something to light that it's not, you know, I'm not really worried about like you sitting there and being like, the only reason I'm talking to Alan is because I want to be rich and famous. Like, I don't think that's true, but 
you know, I think we both realize like there's this weird performative element in which we are performing for other people to view and consume the content and you want the content to be good and you want the content to be just, you know, as consumable as, you know, you want to make it consumable and but you don't want it to be so consumable that you're just making Mr. Beast videos and you're just making, you know, you know, you want, there's this weird balance of, you know, so just pointing stuff out like that, it just, I just like doing it because it's like once you call it out and once you laugh at it, it's sort of easier to accept, you know, like yeah. there are contradictions. There just are weird contradictions or, or things that not necessarily cancel each other out, but just there's dual. Lots of things have multiple purposes, you know, yeah. and. Um, you know, it's it's just funny to see those multiple purposes, it's, you know. There could be a teacher who's super strict and everybody falls, you know, falls in line and says what the teacher does, says what they the teacher wants them to say and does what the te they want the teacher to do. But then you may do an impression of the teacher and you're like, meh, 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 and everybody laughs. And suddenly that sort of like takes away some of the power that the teacher had, you know, mm -hmm. or takes takes away, re reframes the situation in such a way. Um, and you sort of like see it in a new way and that that's seeing it in a new way. It's not always like some deep insight that's going to change your whole life, but it's just like, I don't know. It's like fun. It's just like fun to do. And, yeah. and, and you will, and you're able to connect more with people. And sometimes like a, a joke that you say with, uh, you know, super casually is way more of a deeper connection than when you're like, Oh my gosh, I love you. And I look into your eyes, Lucas, and we're in love and we're just so connected and we're so, you know, we're going to have this moment. And I'm going to be vulnerable with you. It's like, Sometimes that's, you know, the funny, the better way to relate to people is just to make a joke and be like, yeah. we're both laughing, we're both having a good time, you know, and, and there's, you know, and suddenly the ice is broken and there's a connection, you know. Yeah. It feels very disarming. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, and it feels like you're, when you're engaging in comedy, it's like you're highlighting something that's just there, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's almost, I think you maybe have a mind where it's like, when it's there, it's hard to ignore and you just like, you feel like you have to <laughs> point it out yeah. and it alleviates some, some tension often. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it does. It does get like, sometimes I have to like bite my, I'm such a talker. I'm such a, like, I love talking. I love joking. Like sometimes I have to like bite my hand to not make a joke. And, um, you know, it's just, I don't know, like some, especially when there's like, like at my last job, <clears throat> actually, you know, I just I just uh, quit my last job to start a new job on Monday, but so I can so I can talk bad about them and say all the horrible things they did, um, but um, like you know, it's just like they they had this thing where you had to put in timesheets every day, and you had to say what you did, and like they were just so they would just baby us about it. And like, they would like have meetings and they'd be like, everybody do this, do that. And I understand that certain people weren't doing the work. So they had to like treat us like babies. But then I would just be like, uh, during the meeting, I would just be like, so like, are we supposed to like submit all our timesheets from last year and this year? And like, do we have to do them today? Cause they, and like everybody would laugh cause they realize like, that's literally what they just said, you know? But it's like it it points to that so moment ridiculous. of like they're babying us. We all know we're being babied. We don't like being babied. They don't like babying us. But this is just what we have to do because of the corporate structure and like pointing that out and alleviating some of the tension. And honestly, it just I think it makes everybody like it. It, it makes it easier to. It honestly makes it easier to do what they're they're asking you to do, because it's like okay, you know, we pointed out how absurd this is, but now well, let's just do it and get it over with. Whereas mm -hmm. like, if you do it, but you don't point out that uh, the absurdity, there's sort of this tension of like, I'm doing it, but there's sort of something that's not being said. There's sort of like, you know, there's sort of this pressure that's still there. Or this still like, so yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. My brain's broken. That's why I do, do comedy. You know, my brain doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Do you feel like you see the world through more of a lighter or like a darker lens if you had to pick one probably just like probably just like genius you know i just see the world i'm like <laughs> have you seen the matrix it's patterns just, everywhere it's all just it's like a mixture of the matrix and peugeot's symbolic world just everything i'm just like oh that's the te devouring mother <laughs> that's that's the behemoth and, blah, 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 and it's just like everyone's like 
<laughs> you know, just uh, that's I mean, it's really unbelievable. If you I, I feel bad sometimes when I talk to like lower, you know, lesser people like you, Lucas, like sort of the like more like the like the I call them like the plebs, you know, sort of like the common people who are just like, you know, they can't see what I see. And it just makes me sad. I'm just like one day maybe you could see a fraction of sort of the intelligence and like the like you the know, Neuralink. We just need the Neuralink and we'll get the to Neuralink and you can download the the uh, the Allen Vision program and you, you too could be like blah, just like Neo in the Matrix, uh bending bending reality. Um but I mean I think in general, I mean, thank goodness. I think I'm like super lucky that I just generally am like kind of happy. Um, I feel bad. I honestly have no idea what to say about people who are like kind of uh, depressive because I'm like, dang, that stinks. Like I'm not the happiest person in the world, but in general, like I'm pretty happy over stuff. Mm -hmm. When when people have a depressive like like personality, that seems so brutal. That seems like every day, like you're just kind of, it sucks, so... Uh, but I think like the good thing about comedy is even when things are bad and you're like, this sucks and this is bad. There's always like 1% of your brain that's like, but it's a little bit funny, you know, like even, even when you think about like the worst, like when you get broken up with or you lose your job or like whatever, like you, I, I think back on that and I'm like, oh, that's painful. But I'm also like, it's a little bit funny. Yeah, it's a it's a little funny of how sad I was to lose my college girlfriend, you know, like that. Yeah. It was horrible and it sucked. But it's also funny to be like, I'm so sad right now. And I'm just I just don't want to just wish she would come back to me. But I also hate her and, and I'm sad. Like, you know, yeah. the, I don't know what to say other than like, that's funny. You know, like that's hysterical, you know, I'm just like. So I think like, to you know, having a comedic mindset just like lets you get through some of the brutal parts because you're like yeah like you know that did stink and wasn't fun but it is a little hilarious to just sit at your desk and have like your boss two feet away from you who just like hates you and you're just like this stinks i'm just gonna be here for the next forever sitting here with my boss just frowning at me and being like Mm, did you do this did you do that and like in the moment you're like this is horrible but looking back i'm like that stinks that's so funny yeah yeah i think it's hard to like zoom out when you're in the moment and it's difficult but there's almost always like light <laughs> when oh you yeah back a bit further but yeah. I, I think it takes getting to a better place to to really appreciate that because i certainly like in some dark times like i wouldn't I wouldn't see a lot of like comedy, but then there are people who I think have a very dark story and see the world even through a dark lens that are really funny because it's their only way to, you know, to really get through, get through life. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, totally. Yeah. Some of the funniest people are just like I hear their stories and I'm like dang that sucks that is brutal i you know it's just like my father used to put cigarettes out on me and my mother would beat me and i ate rocks for lunch and you know i lived in the basement of a trailer you know and <laughs> i'm just like that sucks but it's really fun to talk to you because you're really funny and yeah. uh you know i'm also funny but my parents love me and they give me yummy gifts on christmas and they're very sweet you're to happy. me and i'm very happy and my i you know i love lots of friends and they're like yeah, we ate, you know, wood for lunch and, you know, rocks for dinner and we slept on pins. And I'm like, yeah, I had a big bed and a yummy house and my life was great. So, hey, if you're really funny and you had a hard, hard life, respect. I love the fact you're funny, but I'm really glad that I didn't have to have a horrible life to be funny. <laughs> Do you ever feel like afraid of becoming less funny because you're like a Christian? Because I feel like it's, it's like, you know, like these types of. Um, I can only a, talk like this now. Sanctus yeah. Dominus Day. Yeah, I'm going to only sing everything. I'm just going to have like a light projector behind me and a white robe. And I'm going to be like, I, at Dominus Day. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just also think that like. Like we're. He, like that's one thing that like the new testament is clear about is like we're like fools we're like idiots to god you know of like 
you know, it's like all the time we're just getting like absolutely massacred for being idiots. And like you read Paul's letter to the early churches and he's like, you are the biggest dum-dums. And like, I think that is the window for like, yeah, you're just going to, you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to fully understand everything. You're always going to be bumping your shin into a table. You're always going to look silly. You're always going to see other people looking silly. You're always going to know what to tell someone else that, you know, someone has the information that would save you a lot of time and effort, but you don't have the ears to hear it. And then you're going to look back on not having the ears to hear it. And it's going to be funny, you know? And so I just think that like the irony and the comedy of the world is just built into God's creation. And so like just accepting like, I'm like kind of an idiot. I'm kind of a dumb dumb and I'm going to make a lot of mistakes and like, I'm going to have to try again and try and get be better the next time. But like, that is, um, that's like built into the system. Like that's what it's going to be. So like, I think like it just, I just see it as not like me doing something or me being funny and more of like, that's just part of reality. And like my brain is just broken in such a way that like, I just see that and think it's funny. Mm -hmm. And so like, I just think that's like God's creation is like, yeah, there are moments where it is serious where like, if you think about the the crucifixion and the resurrection and you think about the birth of Christ, it's like, those are meant to be like the Holy of Holies. Those are meant to meant to be the places where like, there's no upside down in the Peugeotian way. There's no like jester. There's no like, you know, whatever where like you're supposed to attend to, but even the, even, even the, even the birth of Christ has the manger element where he's like in a farm, basically around animals, you know, where like there's the irony of like the King being born next to the animals. And there's something ironic and funny, but like, at least the crucifixion, like, it's very serious. And, like, I respect that. And I'm like, yeah, that's not the place or the time to, like, see the ironies in it. Yeah. Um, but, like, apart from, like, that moment, it's, like, the whole world, like, look at, like, what, you know, look at all these letters. It's just, like, <laughs> like, look at, I mean, it was funny, like, I was just doing a Bible study on Ecclesiastes, and they were saying, like, uh, we were reading chapter 7, and I was saying, like, it is better to like uh for the for it to be the end of things than the beginning of things and it's better to mourn than to like laugh and like they're saying all this hard stuff and people in the bible study were like well they're saying that because like it's more rewarding to finish a marathon to start a marathon they're trying to make the point that like well they're going to get this good payoff and it's going to be like a good experience at the end and i'm like the author's not saying that like the author's saying like life sucks and then you die and you should be happy when you die and i'm like the author is saying like this is sucks and is bad but like in my opinion the people at the bible study didn't want to like say that because it's like that's a really harsh criticism and that's like a really hard thing to read in the bible um but i'm like well that's the irony is like yeah you do kind of have to accept like kind of how bad things are and like that's why you need christ it's like if things were just good you wouldn't really need you know this other thing and i'm not trying to make this into a like an evangelism moment but the the thing i want to say is like that's funny it's funny that how much we don't want to accept that it's funny that people want don't want to read ecclesiastes and be like basically it's a complete damnation of everything in the world everything outside of god and it's like saying that everything is meaningless and then people are reading it, you know, in their little study and they're like, um, I think he's saying that like the world is good and that we're all going to be OK. I'm like, no, he's not saying it. he's not saying that he's saying how much everything sucks, <laughs> which is ironic that like in one sense, he's right. The author's right. And then in another sense, it's funny because we don't want to believe I don't want to believe that. No one wants to believe that. Like, you know, I don't want to believe that life is meaningless and bad, but like you kind of have to come to that accepting of it and then the reason i'm saying this is like seeing the irony there seeing like okay this is what the book says this is what i i don't want to believe what it says so i'm still trying to reinterpret it a little bit and then i'm going to avoid what the book says but because i avoid what the book says i'm going to encounter what the books you know like i'm gonna yeah. by not being willing to absorb the wisdom i'm gonna have to learn it elsewhere yes. you know yeah. and so like 
I don't wish for anything bad to happen to anybody, but like, it's funny to see how humans avoid even, even people who are like, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the infallible word of God. They don't, you know, they reinterpret things and they sort of like, don't want to accept certain interpretations. And then that, you know, I don't want to get into like biblical criticism. Maybe I'm already too far down the line, but the point just being of like that, the fact that we don't want to accept it is funny because it's just like, it's us being idiots. It's us being like hard hearted. And it's like, yeah. now we're going to have to learn it the hard way. Okay. You didn't want to learn it the easy way. Now you get to learn it the hard way, which is funny. And so I just think that that, that those sort of oppositional elements, those parts of like what we don't want to believe and what we don't want to accept. I mean, it's true in my heart. It's true in like everybody. And so, like, all you can do is be like, this is funny. Like, you can either be like, this is tragic, or you can be, this is funny. And I, I choose to be like, this is funny. And, like, then what else, you know, what else can you do but, like, just be like, accept it, laugh, and move on, and, like, try try to be a little bit better the next time. So, yeah. to your point, I just don't think that there's any... Um, uh, like, the, like, there's enough messed upness in the world that... I don't think I'll ever have to stop laughing. I don't think I'll get so sanctified that I stop laughing before I'm dead. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe I'm so <laughs> sanctified I never laugh again. But, uh, you know, I don't think I'll fully see the full picture of God so much that I'm never surprised again. And as long as I'm surprised, I'll be laughing. Mm. Uh, also, it's funny that you mentioned, like, I don't know, this is part of how I interpret your question is like, well, this gift of comedy and like, do you think it's going to go away? And like, you know, you think you're going to lose it with your faith? And I'm just like, just, you know, when I was in fourth grade, you're like a loser because you're funny. Like it's low status to be funny when you're like younger. And then people, when you get funny enough that it's like high status, people are like, are you going to lose it? And I'm like, yeah, I like, I like, I was being funny when it meant being bullied and being ostracized. And like when you're a weird kid. So like I, if it, if they didn't, if they couldn't beat it out of me when it was low status, they're not going to beat it out of me when it's high, you know, like when people appreciate it. So I've been through the ringer of being funny. I've been, you know, I've been funny enough for long enough that like, you know, I've been making fart jokes since like second grade. So like, I don't think they can beat it out of me. And I don't know, unless God comes to me and says, I got to stop being funny. I, I think it's, I think it's going to be okay. I think so too. I asked the question because, well, there's this thing of, to me, some of the funniest jokes are like at the expense of others or, um, they're like really, really vulgar. And there's something about, you know, modern Christian culture that's just kind of like <laughs> so cringy that it can't be funny. You know, it's like, I cannot, it's like anti-smoking, um, you know, uh, yeah. marketing things where it's like, but I know what you mean. It's, uh, it well, begs, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just think that that's something that, I mean, that's a development of basically every normal person, left, you know, like, I need to be careful of what I say, but everyone left the church and then the church, I think when, when people start leaving, I think you lean into the things that separate you from the rest of the world. Uh -huh. And I think part of what separated the church from the rest of the world was sort of that like clean cut, like we don't believe in cursing. We don't believe in this. And like, there's truth to that. You shouldn't just go around cursing, but like it became such an, yeah. a, a distinction that like you couldn't even make good art. I'm like, you know, like, if you think that the Bible's just like, oh, be nice to each other, and like, there's no, like, I hope you don't read the Old Testament. I hope you never crack open that book, because it's like, you know, like, I know that point has been made before, but I think, I think it's just, you know, religious types sort of leaning into the clean cut image, because that separated them from secular yeah. culture. And uh, my hope is to like, I honestly think that's part of like, why I like looking at art and analyzing movies and everything is because it helps you rediscover the truths that are right there and putting it in language that religious people who can lean way too overcorrected, who can lean way too clean cut, it sort of like reopens them to these truths that have always been true. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I do think there's wisdom. I don't think, you know, there's definitely comedy and art that I don't believe I should consume that I used to consume. Like, I think you need to be careful um, and you need to be careful about like the spirit that you watch it in. But I think there's a lot of room where most good art has something true to say. And that's why it's good. You know, 
So sorry to cut you off, but oh, uh, it's it's a very good insight. I actually really like it. I I hadn't heard it expressed like that before. I've heard that like modern day religion is way too focused on the 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 clean aspect of it and the the morality, but it's so much more than that. And um, it's a pretty good explanation for it. I'd never heard it before, so I appreciate I appreciate it. I'm I wanted to talk a bit about memes because. Uh, my generation like i was brought up on memes and i'm noticing that my parents already like they, they really don't understand any bit of it whereas with yeah. us and our generation it seems fundamental even like it's it's winning elections and stuff like that mm-hmm. um well i'll ask you a bit what you as a comedian think about memes and if you <laughs> consume memes or understand meme language and after that i want to speak about like who is the most memeable uh, in this little corner? Because I have some some ideas, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I think memes are just like condensed language. Um, like, you know, I think in the past, basically, to have the reason we had the concept of like a classical education, where you're going to read like, you know, Odysseus, uh, you know, the Odyssey and the Iliad and and the Bible and Shakespeare. The reason you had that is like partially just because you would be able to reference a character and you'd be able to be like, oh, that guy's like Puck or that guy's like Hamlet or that guy's like, you know, whoever. And then it would be like, oh, that guy's like really depressed and sad, you know, like or like, you know, oh, OK, I know what you mean. So it's just like you you sort of like consume all this culture so that you could have a common language so that you could say like, oh, like, you know, like oh yeah like he's a real job figure like a bible reference or like whatever you know like oh you know you know he's a doubting time doubting thomas we still have that phrase at least in english of like you know that's a bible character where you say like oh someone who who doesn't believe you know like who doesn't believe what you tell them um you call him like a doubting thomas and um <clears throat> yeah so i think like people have always had this concept of condensing language um I just think with the internet, you can add text and an image and you know exactly like the words aren't enough. I don't think people realize how like ineffective words are. You know, it goes back to like when I said, like, you could explain to someone how to get six pack abs. Like you got to eat this and you got to work out like this. You could explain it to them in like five minutes, but it doesn't mean they're going to do it. Whereas like a meme is not just language. It's not just information. It's also like a feeling. It's referencing a character it's representing like you can use, you can like edit the image, you can like deep, you know, deep fry the meme or like pixelate the image or like do all these things that represent like chaos or like out disorderliness or like all these sorts of messages. And all that's condensed down to an image that you can consume in like probably like less than a second, you know? And so like, I think memes are just like our, you know, the younger generation's way of like, you know, certain things stick around like Spider-Man memes because Spider-Man is, everyone knows who Spider-Man is, you know? Yes. And yeah. everyone, you know, so like things that have very strong emotions tied to them, um, I think do better with memes and then you can sort of shift it around with the text and how you present it. But it's really, it's like, it's like to do like a food metaphor. You, If you want a good meme, you'd want a... Um, you want something that at least starts out very pungent, either negative or positive. It'd be like, you know, like blue cheese or like, you know, some really strong like flavor. And then if you like it or don't like it, you can like sort of modulate it. But if something's like not offensive, it's a lot harder to make it memeable. So it has to be something like Donald, you know, Donald Trump is really memeable or like, you know, some touch point or, you know, uh, this whole language of like stuff that, a lot of people have experienced and a lot of people have a very sharp emotion that they associate with it. Or there's a clear, clear emotion, like even, even embarrassment of like, you know, someone who's like kind of embarrassing to think about, like, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, that makes for like a good meme. Um, but yeah, it's just a way of like immediately, like, you know what I'm talking about in like one image, if I send you a meme. Why do you think that, well, in my experience, people are very memeable when they're being super, earnest and and really like you know like they're not making a joke like it's the th- things that are very serious seem like the most me like i'm watching lord of the rings recently i watched it back and yeah, it's yeah. so memeable like it's it's the most memeable set of movies i've ever watched because it's like so serious 
Yeah. Uh, why, why do you think that is? Because I'm not sure myself. Yeah. Well, you can join my Patreon and learn. Um, <laughs> the um, well, I, I just I I think it's serious. I in my you know my eternal wisdom that flows from my brain um is uh I just think that like archetypal moments are memeable because like you know all the memes that come out of Lord of the Rings are like one does not simply walk into Mordor. You know that that feeling of like. You you think it's going to be simple, but like it's not simple. One does not simply, you know, I'm using this all. One does not simply get a six pack abs. One does not simply tell their mom that they broke a vase. You know, like one does not like it's it's the idea that you think you know what you're getting yourself into, but you don't understand what you're getting yourself into, and there's a lot deeper yes, yes. problematic. But that is such an archetypal moment. Yeah. It's like everyone's had that moment where they're like. And it's honestly, it's it's when really mundane things happen, but you realize it's really mundane, and yet I totally relate to Boromir saying this thing, that that like you, oh, that meme hits you so hard. It's like it could be like, you know, you're trying to use a vending machine, but the vending machine isn't working, and the buttons don't make any sense, and then you think to yourself, one does not simply use a vending machine, you know, just like even though vend using a vending machine that's stupid, why why would you care? That's such a dumb joke. And yet you totally relate to this character of like, I thought it was going to be simple. You know, I thought, you know, we've all had that moment trying to use the subway or trying to use the the train transportation where you're like, well, it's going to be really easy. I'll just get on the train and get, you know, get to, you know, whatever, wherever you guys and, you know, I, I guess you guys go to the ocean with the train. I don't know. What do you guys do in the Netherlands? Uh, I'll go to North Holland. Um, but, you know, you, you go to the train station and it's complicated and the train's delayed and like no one has directions and you buy the wrong ticket and they yell at you. And, you know, and you have this moment where you're like, I thought using the train would be like a piece of cake. And yeah. then it's like a nightmare. And so that moment really. Uh, sorry, that moment um, totally hits you super hard. Um so, uh, yeah, so I think any sort of earnest archetypal, mo like those moments are really serious where you're like, or they're, they're earnest where you're like, I feel this way, or yeah. this is what I'm experiencing. And those are the ones that you, if someone's being core, if someone's being flippant or not, like if they, if they're not being genuine in that way, it's less relatable. But when someone's like, I'm just going to say what I'm feeling. Yeah. I'm not going to put any like, this is, on it. It is. this is how I feel. Yeah. And because of how serious the Lord of the Rings is, everyone at every moment, it's like, I always laugh. Like every character can just randomly drop like a gem of wisdom. They'll just be like standing, looking in the horizon and they'll be like, the day is never over until the keep has been earned. And I'm like, well, that's not how I talk. You know, just like, they'll just drop like the most like hard bar. And I'm just like, <laughs> I would just probably be like, oh, there are clouds over there. You know, I would I would just say something stupid, but they say like something about like the state of my soul and like this is what I'm feeling. I'm like, this is the this is the problem I'm having of like I, you know, and they say like, you know, I, I have two loyalties that are fighting each other, or, you know, like um, you know, and and that uh that totally uh hits you deep and then it you know that deep, getting hit deep will re-emerge in a moment in your life where I'm like I'm feeling just like you know I'm feeling exactly the way this character felt or I'm yeah. feeling you know so if you're being earnest they're much more likely to stumble across that emotion later who's your favorite character on Lord of the Rings out of curiosity it's funny I just literally it became my it became my subway show I can't use you know there's no internet on the subways uh, so I have to download a movie on Amazon and then watch it. So that I just literally just, I mean, I'm not even the biggest Lord of the Rings fan. It's great. I love it. But I just re rewatched it. I'm halfway through Return of the King. Um, I guess, uh, well, A, I love the fact that he with Gandalf, like Gandalf is not like, just like, he doesn't like not say what he's thinking. He yeah. like, he's kind of like, because the, sometimes the wise character just like never speaks. And like the when the one time they do speak, it's just like the craziest, like, you will find the secret to the blah, blah, blah. Like Gandalf just tells people like, shut up, don't talk. I'm going to have this meeting. Like, do not speak during the meeting. You're an idiot. I'm the genius wizard. Don't, you know, like, yeah. he totally is like a, like a con, you know, he brings in the Hobbit. He brings the, so I kind of love the fact that he's like, you know, he's still a little mysterious and will like, have you, you know, have some wisdom, 
but he'd also be like, you're being an idiot and this is dumb. And I was just like, you know, he's not at all, you know, he's not the archetypal like wise character. He'll also just be like, this is what I'm feeling. But um, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think favorite, I think it's going to be Sam. Sam just like, just, I'm like, I Sam's so right the whole time. Frodo's just being like a prima donna. Frodo's like, it's so hard carrying this, you know, ring that weighs an ounce. And my life is so difficult. And then Sam is just like, we got to do this. This is how we're going to do it. He doesn't trust Gollum. You know, like, I love, you know, he's real with it. Also, I was a fat kid. So respect, respect. You know, he did that while being fat. So, you know, respect to Sam. But uh, yeah, that's probably Same. a number one. And uh, which character are you most like, you think? <laughs> probably Aragorn. Probably like I'm like probably the natural king. I mean, probably. It's just like I think people see me and they're like, they know that my rightful place is on the throne. And like when I show up, I like I'm smoking my pipe and I have my hood on and it's raining, you know? <laughs> They're like, who's that ranger in the corner? And it's like, no, that's just Alan. I'm just like, oh. but you know, that's probably probably my burden to bear, just being the mysterious, handsome stranger. But you know, it's not fair. It's not fair, Lucas. I I don't think it's fair. You know, I fair. wouldn't. Have, but <laughs> um, it would be Aragorn. I would. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It might be Sam. I like Sam. I just like him as a character. It's it's yeah. hard to. Uh, he's a he's a cool dude. Um, but you know, it'd you be a combination could... of Sam and Aragorn. But okay. the good looks of Aragorn and the coolness of Aragorn. Yeah, like everything... if Sam was like a ripped tall guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If yeah. Sam was ripped and cool, and everybody respected him, then that would be me. Okay, that's fair. If he was six foot five, that would be me. <laughs> Yeah, I think my favorite is Sam too. Simply because of the courage, I think. Um, which I didn't... Like, I really like Frodo when I first watched it because, you know, you're like... If you're nine years old, you just like the main character for some reason. Um, but I'm finding that the more movies I watch now, the more I dislike the main character a lot. Um, mm. Whether that be, like, Harry Potter or um, Lord of the Rings or Hunger Games. They usually just suck. The main, the main, the main, I don't know why, but they're usually just like not not really good people, you know. Yeah, I was thinking about this. I don't know if you will relate to this at all, but often I feel like at certain restaurants, the appetizers are better than the entrees. Mm. <laughs> this is the wisdom of the ages. Is sometimes <laughs> you have to order an appetizer as an entree, and you'll be more satisfied. But I think like sometimes the main character has so much responsibility for the story and like to go like do all this stuff. And like, it's sort of exhausting for them. Whereas like a side character can just be like, I'm going to be funny now. And now I'm going to leave, you know? And so, you know, I do think it's easier to relate to the side characters because, you know, the main character sort of has to be the center of attention for so long that it's, they kind of have to be like annoying and self obsessed, you know, because it's like yeah. their story. Yeah. It's like if a side character came in and being like, wow, I really got to do this and this is my goal and this is what I care about and this is blah, blah, blah. You'd be like, get out of here, annoying side character. Like, shut up. We don't care about your problems. But like the main character, you have to care about the problems for like three hours of the movie, you know? And so uh, the side characters can just be like, I'm the silly one and I'm the serious character. And, I'm, you know, and that's kind of more fun because it's like you're just having like a little appetizer portion. You're like, hmm. That was delicious. It was funny to listen to him be funny for five minutes. Yeah. Versus like the main character, you're like, why are you whining for seven books? Shut up and kill Voldemort. Just kill him. Get a gun. Go to the mortal world. Get a gun and kill Voldemort. You know? Yeah. By the end, you know. So it's like they have more responsive. The main character always has like more responsibility for the story than like any other character. So I think that I mean, I agree with you. Like sometimes you are like, shut up, you're annoying, but like. You know, it's like, well, you know, Frodo's got to get us through three books. You know, he's got to get us through all this. So, you know, uh, he's really got to be self-obsessed and like self, you know, really concerned with his journey and his story. And, you know, that's going to get us through all this long period of time. But I don't know. I'm not. Uh, maybe that's right or not. I don't know. Who knows? So 
sorry to ask Lord of the Rings questions so much, but no, uh, this is great. I, I just I, watched them, so like okay, it's... good. Well, I was like, I was at the end, and I forgot this part where like a lot of the characters like they leave, uh, yeah, and they take they go on a boat to the west, and um, mm. and then Frodo leaves as well, and I wasn't completely clear as to why why he left to leaving the other hobbits because i understood like all the mythical type of creatures had to leave and uh, dominion came back to man and stuff like that um but why did frodo go well i hmm. <laughs> i think he um i don't think he like really fits into like hobbit the hobbit world anymore you know like i i think he he's too cool yeah <laughs> it's like me it's like why i have to leave my friends i'm like i'm i'm now too cool I'm now six seven and no one can relate to me i'm too awesome um but yeah i mean i think like sort of his journey does like he becomes very not hobbit hobbit like during his journey and um yeah i'm not sure he uh he fits in with like the regular like world anymore and like how much he has to like question his purpose and his identity, um, which is like very unhobbit of someone to do. And I, I don't even think Sam really understands what Frodo goes through, you know, which makes Sam a lot more likable. I think Sam views it as like, um, Sam views it as like a task to do but Frodo really understands even evil and like the draw of evil. Like he's constantly trying to give the ring back to the, uh, the um, to like Sauron and all these, like he understands the draw of evil and like, you know, he's like tempted by evil um, in a way that Sam really isn't tempted. And I think that like putting, when that like gets inside of you, I think it's, um, it's hard to continue to earnestly like commit to certain things. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's sort of like, yeah, like, hmm, like, like, yeah, it, it's like someone's playing, you know, it, it's, you can't really fit into someone else's paradigm anymore of like all the hobbits really do is like hang out and smoke pipe tobacco and, you know, eat food and, that's sort of the point of them. And even Bilbo, I think, is kind of just like, that was one crazy adventure with a dragon. And like, but I, I'm just going to go back to being a normal dude. You know, yeah. like you can see Bilbo being a regular dude easier than you can see uh, Frodo. Yeah, so, Frodo's on something for sure. Yeah, Frodo's like seen the, the veil torn back. Um, so it's, I think, a little harder. He sees all like the machine elves, like the DMT realm <laughs> half the time probably yeah. yeah yeah and i think just like yeah it's like uh yeah i think i think he can't he cannot never go back and that sounds like it's better than like the, the hobbits he's like he's like above the hobbits but i do, I think it's just different i think mm -hmm. it's uh you know it's like when you're a kid and like you'll see kids just, just like um obsessed with like candy you know and you know they'll be like oh, i just want candy and like as an adult you'd be like yeah i like candy candy's fine there's nothing wrong with it but like i do not want to eat candy as much as you do you know like when you can't pretend that you do because like yeah. you're like i have a palate you know like i want more complex flavors and everything and uh it's just like you can't go back to just being a kid who's like i would do anything for a bag of candy right now you know the doors, the doors been the veil has been shut, you know. The door's yeah. been closed, and you have to move on. And like Frodo's already been like, you know, he's no longer just like I want to eat twelve breakfasts a day, you know. What's your favorite meal? <laughs> I need to know this. This is like essential. This is like, uh, I mean, if you're gonna become the Ubermensch, let's be clear, guys. I need to get I all the right ingredients to figure guys, out like how to become listening. like Alan. If you've been listening to this podcast and you don't have at least, let's say, 13 pages of notes, you've messed you up. You start over. You Do should. not listen to any more. Stop. This is actually going to be a 13-part masterclass. Oh, my. What are you doing? You idiot. You've wasted my time if you're listening to this. I hate you. It's a big problem. Um, <laughs> you need to know exactly what I eat for breakfast. Write it down. 
Ex Benedict! Ex Benedict! Um, um, <laughs> I will say, just like, this is very, like, <laughs> um, um, I like can't, I'm such like, I don't know if you have, oh. you have, Lab you have Labradors, right? In, yes. In, uh, in Europe. You've got those, right? We do. But, okay. I don't know what you guys, I've, I don't know if, you know, what you guys live in, what sort of, I've, I just saw the Lord of the Rings. I assume it's very similar it's to like that. It's like the Shire. But it's cold. like, <laughs> but like people would tell me as a kid, like Labrador retrievers, specifically as dogs, will just like eat until they throw up. Yeah. You know? And like, if you don't, aren't, aren't careful, like they'll just ask for food all day. It's like, that's me. Like I emotionally relate so much to like a Labrador retriever uh, in that way of like, I just love eating. So I just like, I don't know if this is a long-term solution, but like, I've just elected the way of pain when it comes to, you know, when it comes to food of just like, I can't eat anything yummy and scrumptious and delicious. Enough. I like not bad, but like it has to be like boring. Like I lo I don't eat any food that I hate, but I also can't eat any food that I love. So I live in like purgatory of food. Ah, of yeah. like of like it just can't be yummy, delicious, scrumptious. Like if I see like bagels and like I mean, whatever, you guys don't have bagels in Europe. We do. Not, you, I don't think you do. Um and <laughs> and Oh, you would love to to come here, man. The food is so bland. I'm, Netherlands is famous for it. Like. Yeah, but I yeah. So I just like literally try and eat like I eat like probably like ground meat with like taco seasoning and like put some salsa in there. I eat for breakfast. I just have like I put like coconut oil and butter in my coffee, and that's what I have for breakfast. I try and do like low carb. It's very boring, but like. Just like, dude, when I see yummy, delicious, scrumptious treats, like I work in an office where they have lots of meetings and they bring in a lot of food and there's just like yummy burritos and there's rice and there's like, you know, they bring in pizza. I'm just like, yeah, of course, I just want to eat delicious, yummy pizza all day. But like, I can't. I have to eat ground beef with taco seasoning. Yeah. And like, you know, gonna make I, I mean, it's like, I mean, kind of. It sounds like that, but like I'm just the you think I'm trying to be the Ubermensch, but it's really I'm just the Labrador retriever who will just eat until I throw up. <laughs> so it's like, you know, the only way to just be normal is just like to have your meals and then like yeah. have like, you know, I have like my like peanuts and pistachios and like maybe some beef jerky or something, just like really boring, like high protein fill you up food. So maybe that's lame to say, but like it's just like I. Food is, I think food is something where a lot of people never have struggled with it or like they, it's just easy to like eat the right amount of food. And then there's a bunch of people who that's not true. Yeah. And the bridge, the bridge will never be gapped between those groups of people. Like, like you'll just never, there will never be an understanding between those two groups of people. So, I mean, my 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 worldview is just you have you're in the eternal struggle of eating boring food that's very filling so you don't eat all day so that's my that's my wisdom of the ages and break that down people break it down so let's say tomorrow you receive the death penalty and you get one more meal and you can get anything what is it that you're ordering so without the like long-term health perspective probably like um beef with taco seasoning <laughs> You serious? No, 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 no. It'd be insane. It'd be like a thirty-eight course meal. I mean, it'd just be like the most insane, yummy. I mean, I really do. Hmm. Hmm. Be like maybe, maybe like either Mexican food or steakhouse. I like steakhouse food a lot. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have steakhouse, like crema spinach and mashed potatoes, like a big steak. That's really good. Mm. Or just like burrito, like fajitas, like Mexican food. That's also just like, also just being a glutton. Just the quantity would be very important. Like when they give me the electric chair, I want my body to like explode because of how much like <laughs> the gases that build up in my stomach and, you know, from all the, all the Mexican food that I ate. The yeah. Day. Um, but so, I mean, it's just, you know, yummy, delicious. Like I prefer soft serve ice cream to like regular ice cream and because it's just gluttonous it's just like there's 
soft serve is like more about the amount it's like it's more like filling it's like you know regular ice creams like the flavors and like the gelato the sweetness it's just like soft serve is kind of bland you know it's just like it's just one flavor but you get to give you a lot of it so i don't know it's just it's you know this is why this is why i am the way i am so but yeah yummy delicious food but uh, it's impressive you're able to deal with like wanting to eat all the time i mean it's not easy it, it seems like it requires self-control you have a lot of self-control you think i i think you just need to build up all the different like this is part of like why i, I mean i don't think i do really any any like have an exceptional amount i think i mean this master class needs to remain like credible so yeah yeah yeah. Never mind. i have an nice. extreme amount of self -control. none of you will be able to live the life i live none of you <laughs> you especially can try, you, you can try it if you think I'm not talking about you, I'm especially talking about you. You are failing at life, okay? Thank you. Thank you. So, so you people need to get it together. Come um, on. <laughs> you're losers. You can start. Baby's first step is baby steps. Go to Lucas's channel. Watch all of his videos. Live that life for five years. Then realize how bad it is and what a loser <laughs> Lucas is. And then you start my masterclass. You need at least six years before you can start this episode. If you've started already and you haven't done that, stop the episode right now. All right? I need you to start watching Matt Fraser's sprint event, CrossFit Games 2016, incline push-ups, Espalda and Casa, some weighted pull-ups, hitting tiles because I enjoy it. Okay? You need to get through that for five years and then you start this. Sorry, what was the question? I think five oh, years. It's not very long. I think it takes a bit longer, but oh my no. yeah, yeah, we'll see. Well, but everyone yeah. learns as quick as you do. But I think uh, my, I think yeah, just like being really honest with yourself of like where you are. I think people don't, they don't want to like having self control is really just creating the, the, you know, the habits and the like the framework for what you're capable of and what you want to achieve within those parameters. And I think like, I mean, it kind of, I think especially you just need to say like, I suck is you need to be brutally honest in the areas where you're, you can be honest with the areas you're good. And like the areas where you're actually decent at something, like don't lie and be like, I suck at everything. But like the areas where you're not good, you need to be honest as well. Like the reason I like the Labrador metaphor is like, you know, I could say like, oh, it's hard to like eat healthy or like it's hard to like I, I you know, I like food, dude. I don't just like food. like that's just self-deception. Like I'm just a Labrador who will eat until I, you know, just like eat and eat and eat. And so like I could lie to myself and sound more normal and more cool and be like, you know what? Like I like food or blah, blah, blah. But it's like, dude, let me just be honest with myself when it comes to food. If I don't like stay within the boundaries, I have zero self-control. So uh, it's a lot easier to do it that way um, and uh, talk about it that way. So, um, you know, I think being brutally honest with yourself of like the areas where like you are a baby level zero, like white belt, you know, and if you do that and if you're honest about those areas, then you can at least like start and like meet yourself at the area that you need to be at, you know, of like what's the, you know, and some people it's like, People don't want to admit if you've never lifted weights before, you don't want to admit like, I have no idea. I'm an it, excuse me. I'm an idiot, but that's what you need to do. You need to be like, I don't know how to lift weights. I'm an idiot. You need like the baby of the baby steps, you know? And, uh, it stinks. Cause like, what kind of, you know, you could be like, well, what kind of person doesn't know how to run? It's like, well, if you've never run before, you don't know how to run, you know, like, like, it's like, you know, and so uh, just be honest with like the areas that you want to excel in and like, and be like, um, and just be honest about that stuff. And then, then when you're honest with how much of a neophyte idiot that you are, then you can start being not an idiot by like gaining the skills. But like, if you, if you sort of deceive yourself into being like, you know what, like I've, I've got this under control. It's like, well, you probably, don't, you know, you're just, you're just kidding yourself. And then once you things get stressful. Are you good at being an idiot? like that oh yeah it's key it's key it's one of the what's one of my strongest skills being an idiot um is uh well just like being honest of just like especially with comedy it's just like you know the, the funniest moments are when like you think one thing and then you're proven to be wrong you know it's like 
<laughs> you know, is when you try and do a plan and then it doesn't work out at all, you know, of like, we've all had that moment where you're yeah. like, oh, I'm, this is not what I expected. So, I mean, it's not fun. And I'm not going to pretend like, oh, I love thinking of myself as like an idiot who doesn't know anything, but you know, in the areas that really matter to you, I think taking that and maybe, you know, maybe you don't want to call yourself an idiot, but like, you know, taking that sort of beginner mindset and being like, really like, you don't know anything, you have to admit that you're a beginner. Uh, I think taking that mindset is a way to make progress in an area because it's really easy to deceive yourself about what's happening. And, you know, and clinging to sort of like your status or your own understanding of yourself. And, uh, you know, they're in comedy and in, in any hierarchy, you just see so many, so many people who are like, oh, I'm going to be a famous singer one day, yeah. or I'm going to be this. And it's just like, they're making no progress, you know? And you'll even see people who are like way, who are like 40, 50 years old, still trying to be actors or actresses. And it's like, you, you, you know, like, it's not going to happen. You know, like, it's like, and I don't want, I don't mean that in a mean way, but I just mean it in like a, like, just be honest with yourself of like, you don't, you're, you're not actually as close to your goal as you thought you were. And if you're just honest, you could reassess the situation and figure out something that's working better for you. But a lot of people don't want to take that attitude because it means admitting how little you actually know about the situation. Yeah. Write it down, people. Write that down. <laughs> Closing question. Do you know any witches? uh i think yeah like uh like i do have some people at my church who said they practice witchcraft uh formerly so i guess nice x witches um so like palm readings telling the future stuff like that um or at least one person i can i know of so i guess they wouldn't have ever thought of themselves as like an evil witch but like definitely tapping into that sort of stuff so um yeah at least one okay that's gonna be uh, my next adventure i'm gonna try to become out. a witch no i just figure out what it is i'm trying to figure it out so i it's yeah. not really so much of a thing here but i'm hearing a lot of people from the u.s so that at <laughs> least know a witch you know so it's interesting uh alan do you have any last things to to say before you know this master class comes to an end honestly thing i i think is most important to say is just looking at your your videos and your comments i don't think anyone in your audience is ready or deserving for the wisdom yet so if you want to delete all this and just you know say this was a waste of time i totally respect that you know i just it's like you know it's like giving a you know it's like teaching calculus to like uh, your cat you know like i think like i'm not sure that this will actually help anybody because of how high level it is you know so if you want to delete it and you just like admit like, hey, my my audience is ready for like the ABC song and the mm -hmm. one, two, three. Like yeah. if, you, if you just want to have that, you know, I'd be your sort of thing. Like, sure. But, you know, I don't want to I don't want to overwhelm anybody with just like how much wisdom per capita, you know, wisdom per word ratio. It might blow up your wisdom per word ratio, you know? Yeah, so I don't like, want to give you the wrong idea or anything yeah. like that. I'd say like for you, like you get like a thousand words, you might get like a one pearl of wisdom or yeah. like half maybe. And like, yeah. this is probably like five, five pearls per like what one or two words now. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's too far from the norm to like, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe it will have to require the Neuralink thing, but um, I mean, we'll it's it. your call. I don't, you know, All I don't right. want to tell you what to do with your channel. Cause you know, it's, you know, but you know, I just, that's just what I wanted to, to end it with. No, it's really, you know, maybe it was, maybe this was all just a big nothing. Alan, thank you. Thank you for thank your you. time. Uh, Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm excited to see what people think of your, <laughs> of your answers and comments. And uh, I'm excited to see mostly how much money this, this brings us both. Hey, so uh, me too, brother. All right. I'll talk to you later. Nice good talking. You. Talk you later. Yeah, we should uh, yeah. yeah connect again. See you. Have a good Sunday.